one with the other. Uh, this is seamless and it's harmonious uh, in its manner in which all things are done by them. I, I just put up some quick little illustrations there. You know, uh, all throughout God's creation, you're going to see trees. You know, very important in there. You know, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. You know, how man was originally comprised, how we will be. You know, soul, body, spirit. Uh, the three spheres of authority in the earth, the home, the church, the government. Uh, this is something you're going to see over and over and over again. Three, the number of perfection. So when we have the Spirit of God moving upon the face of the waters, upon the face of the deep, uh, the indication is that something, according to the will of God, is about to occur. All that's needed is for the will to be verbalized in order for the action to occur. And that's what we see when we go into verse 3. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. God's will that there be light. It gets verbalized and it occurs. You know, one of the things I've done, and I'd encourage you to do the same thing, and every time in the Bible where it says God said, God spoke, or you know, any place where you've got God speak, saying something, underline it. Underline it. It's important. God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God said, now this, of course, is the person of the Word of God. Now, over in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Now, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and what out him was not anything made that was made. Okay? The word of God is God. He is with God. Nothing was made without him because his part in the process is to verbalize the will of the Father, and then the Holy Spirit of God performs the act. You know, this is uh, beautifully just beautifully illustrates the symbiosis of the Trinity. Three separate, distinct personalities, perfectly unified, creating the Godhead. God the Father wills for His light to shine in and to dispel the darkness. God the Word verbalizes the Father's will. Let there be light. And instantaneously, the Holy Spirit of God dispenses the light of God, which negates and overwhelms and eliminates the darkness that was there. And there was light. Okay, there was nothing gradual about it. There was nothing minimal. You know, I, you know, I remember as a kid, big deal. You know, we, we had had uh, the, the lights where you could slowly turn it up and turn it down. wasn't like that. It was like, pow! There it was. Okay, and the immensity of the light of God completely voided the darkness of the sin of the devil. And as we will see. Okay. God does, though, he doesn't banish darkness out of the creation. He allows it, but only when and as he decides it will be to accomplish God's will and purpose. And it, it's that way with everything. Uh, which the Lord wills to be. Okay? It is. Uh, 
Uh, if it hasn't come to pass, it will come to pass. God said, let there be light, and there was light. And there wasn't anything that anyone could do to stop it from coming. It's complete. Okay? And it was perfect, exactly as he willed it to be. You know, that's the thing with Satan. Satan cannot and never will be able to hinder or negate the will of God. He's going to try. He's been trying now for 6,000 years. He hasn't stopped it yet. He's not going to stop it. You know, this is one of the reasons why the words of God are so vital. And it's why Satan strives to know them. I'm going to tell you, he knows the scriptures better than any one of us does. He tries to erase them. He tries to confuse them. He tries to change them. He attacks the words of God, verbalized by the word of God and acted on by the Holy Spirit of God because of the immutability and the immensity of their power. And he knows that that's what he has to attack are the words of God. Go to 2 Peter chapter 1 with me. 2 Peter first chapter 19 to 21 We have also a more sure word of prophecy whereunto ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. All right, Genesis 1-4. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. God sees all things. And he evaluates and then decrees whether what he sees is good or bad. We read later on in the chapters of Genesis where God came down to see what they were doing in Babel. Okay. You know, why did God have to come down? Well, God does. God has from time to time. He doesn't have to. Let me get there. He came down as he so often has done, as a man, walked around to see what they were doing, to hear what they were saying, to see what was going on. Said, okay, we're going to put a stop to this. But he sees all things. And like I say, he evaluates what he sees, and then God makes a determination, good or bad. There are no gray areas with God. Nothing is subjective. Nothing is questionable. Nothing is debatable. Nothing is middling or mediocre. It's light or it's dark. It's good or it's evil. It's clean or it's unclean. It's right or it's wrong. It's holy or it's unholy. It's righteous or it's abominable. There's no middle ground with God. And that's why the world hates the Lord and why it hates his Bible. Because it leaves them no wiggle room. There's no place in there you can say, well, but, maybe, perhaps, could have, should have, but, no. It's this or it's that. There's no 40 shades of gray. <laughs> uh, it's either light or it's dark. He makes no accommodation for any of that. With God, everything is dogmatically this or that. It is or it is not. It's that simple. 
wipes off like that. All it is as far as God's concerned. You know? That's why we've got to leave the questions and the doubts for those who have no faith. You know? They have no faith in the Lord. They have no faith in His words. You know? Because He and them are sure and they are steadfast and they are unmovable. God declares his light to be good. Therefore, the darkness that it eliminates is neither good nor of God. Now again, God's going to allow darkness for his own purposes and reasons to continue within the restrictions and boundaries of which he allows it. But he is not the author of of darkness. Oh, what about Isaiah 45, 7? We brought this up last week where it states that he forms the light and creates the darkness. Okay, well, yeah. Again, God does take personal responsibility for everything that he allows in his universe. You know, that's doctrinal fact. For example, go to uh, Psalm 18. Psalm 18, 9 through 12. We'll look at a few verses. Psalm 18, beginning at verse 9. He bowed the heavens also and came down. And darkness was under his feet. And he rode upon a cherub and did fly. Yea, he did fly upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness his secret place. His pavilion round upon him were dark waters and thick clouds of the skies at the brightness that was before him his thick clouds passed hailstones and coals of fire and you remember back in the story of Moses and Israel uh, going down to Mount Sinai and the Lord comes down upon them but he's covered in thick clouds and thick darkness why? they can't see the glory of God because of their sin Okay. That Moses goes up. You know, we read in Exodus 34. Moses has been up there on the mountain. You know, uh, he was up 40 days and 40 nights. Came back down. They had sinned with a golden calf that magically came out of the fire. Remember that? <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, and he breaks. And that, he goes back for another 40 days and 40 nights. He's up. He comes back down, and his face is glowing, supernaturally shining, and they can't abide to look at him. That's just from him being in God's presence. Okay. Serves God's purpose. <coughs> Revelation 1.7 Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindred of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. Okay. He's going to come back first, the blessed hope, and okay. the rapture, going to come in clouds so that the world can't see him when he takes us out of here. When he comes back with us at the end of the tribulation period to establish his millennial reign, which is what this is speaking of here. Again, he comes with clouds. But this time, every eye can see him. And they're like, oh boy, we messed up. <laughs> oh yeah. In fact, let, let's stay in Revelation. Go to Revelation uh, 16. Revelation 16, 10 and 11. And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain, and blasphemed the God of heaven, because of their pains and their sores were repented not of their deeds. Well, what's going on here is exactly what happened in Exodus chapter 10. Okay, the plagues that God sent upon Egypt are the plagues he's going to be sending here on the earth during the tribulation period. And he sends a darkness. There. A darkness that is so dark, so that it can be felt. And they gnaw their tongues. Now back in Exodus, the difference here is it tells us there in verse 23 that over in Goshen, where the Jews were, says there, they had light in their homes. 
God made a separation. Made it, but it's not going to be the case here in Revelation 16. In that God will use darkness. He will allow darkness for His own reasons, for His own purpose. Dory, excuse me. The 7,000 year period of human history. He doesn't remove darkness from the universe. Okay? He's going to use it for his own ends and his own purposes. But he lets it be known, I've got the power over it. I can dispel it anytime I want. hides himself in his glory from men says with the clouds because no, again in our corrupted state man can't bear to see the glory of God but go back again with me for a minute Maybe we're back in John a little bit ago go back to John 1 again and keep reading there pick it up at verse 4 in him was life and the life was the light of man. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Skip down to verses 9 and 10. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. Why? Over to chapter 3, 18 and to 21, John 3. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he <clears throat> had not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. I've told you before, my time when I was a uh, police officer in the city of Chicago, worked the midnight shift, so I go to school during the day. And uh, in the summer times, warm weather in the city of Chicago, what a nightmare. Because every hoodlum out there comes crawling out of bed. They sleep all day long. You know, but boy, as soon as the sun goes down, as soon as the darkness is there, out they come like rats out of a sewer. Boy, we had some rats. Let me tell you, I mean, we have rats there that would scare the cat. <laughs> Do they hiss? They would run away. <laughs> Amen. You know, God allows darkness so that men must choose. Okay? I've said it so many times, your only God-given right in this world is the right to choose. And that's why God allows darkness to stay in this world. Make you choose between light and darkness. What do you say here? Men love the darkness rather than the light. You know, and he'll send darkness. He'll send darkness literally, like we read there, Exodus, Revelation. He sends darkness spiritually. Spiritually. And it's there to try mankind. How they respond to the light, how they respond to darkness. That depends on them, and that depends upon how God's going to act towards them. And I've told the story many times, it's one of my favorites, about, about the, the man in New Guinea, a native there, who eventually got saved. You know, and he talks about how he used to, you know, climb up on the highest tree that he could find at night and cry out. So he knew there was a creator. And he'd cry out to him, and he'd say, you know, do you care about me? He was responding to what light God gave him through the creation. God sent a missionary. 
that man got sick. As long as you keep responding to life, God will respond back. As soon as you stop responding, he cuts you off. Now, B.R. Lincoln, uh, you know, probably one of the, the greatest scholars of the early 20th century uh, in regards to dispensationalism and these things, you know, uh, got to a point where he started messing around with the new versions. God cut him off. He didn't get anything else after that. That's happened many, many a time. And God divided the light from the darkness. God's a divider. God is a divider. And we read this, we're going to see over and over and over again through the Bible, how God divides. And he divides the light from the darkness because they're polar opposites. And things that are different are not the same. Simple concept, right? <laughs> they're different from each other. They're not to meld or share with one another. They are to be separate from each other. And well, like I said, you're going to see this repeated. I mean, not only during the, the, the creation process that we're going through and going to read about here, uh, you know, but again, through the entire Bible, you will see that. I mean, uh, this is, to me, you know, something that was so incredibly evident when I was out in North Dakota, I mean, I mean, dead flat, folks. If you've never been there, I mean, it, it, it's weird. <laughs> it's dead, and I mean, day and night is like that. I mean, it's light, 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 light. All of a sudden, there's like just a little bit, of boom, and then it's black. You know, we don't notice it so much here because we've got so much terrain and things and stuff, and so the rising and, and the going down of the sun, it, it seems to be more of a gradual thing, but it's not like that. You get some place like that where it's dead flat like that, I mean, it's light, and then it's dark, and then it goes from dark, and it is light, and it's that quick. Yeah. Now, if you strive to stay faithful to the Lord, if you're trying to, to be faithful to His words, uh, you're going to be divided. Uh, whether you do it or whether the world does it. Okay? Now you're born again. Number one, I mean, God starts right there. He divides you from death and the life. And you were dead, now you're alive. And you cannot die. This thing can die, praise God. Let it be worm food, best thing it'll ever do for you. You know? You, you've, you've got a, a, a perfect one like the Lord that you're going to get. Okay. He divides you from this unregenerated flesh. I mean, the circumcision made without hands. So it can't affect your soul and spirit any longer. Okay? We are told to separate ourselves from the world. Okay. Uh, I'll tell you what. You try to live for the Lord if you're an old birth Christian out there living for God, you know, like you can go street preaching and stuff. Let me tell you, the world will separate itself from you. <laughs> you know, usually after they throw an insult or two at you or whatever, but, you know, the church of Jesus Christ, though, today is so divided over so many issues, you know, but it all boils down to all those things, light and darkness and how they responded to him. I mean, you're either going to believe what God said, how he said it, where he said it, and accept it, or you don't. Yeah, there's no middle ground. Okay? You know, you either believe he's preserved his words for us, as he said he would do, or you don't. You know, again, I, I was talking uh, this morning to, to some of y'all about uh, the, the thing that David Rizzuti made me aware of, you know, this guy having a seminar you know about you know and he claims to be you know I'm a Bible believer not, not a Bible believer at all how to take your congregation from the authorized version to the modern versions a good night you got a pastor like that here it is take him out the wolf in sheep's clothing 
You know, that's the thing. The faithful, you know, have not moved one bit in over 2,000 years. It's the unfaithful. It's the doubters. It's the compromisers. It's the heretics that keep moving further and further away into darkness. You know? If the light of Jesus Christ is dim today, it's because of the candles that have been put out through apostasy in the church. Alright, back to Genesis 1, verse 5. 1, 5. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and